Julian. I am now live both here on YouTube. Hello, good morning, everybody on YouTube. And I am also live here on Instagram. Good morning. It is probably the darkest day that we've had in terms of just sheer absence of sunlight, lack, as it were, of sunlight. Hello, this is Julian. We're about to start our week five lecture. This is going to be the Lacan edition. Uh, when I'm looking away, I'm looking at the YouTube. Hello, everybody on YouTube. Thanks for joining us. Jenlene is going to be here in just a moment. The birthday girl herself. Uh, it was her birthday yesterday. And uh, so we're going to start in just a couple of moments. If you're joining us for the very first time today, this is an entirely standalone lecture. So you can start right here without any previous knowledge. However, you should also know that this is part of a broader lecture series. That lecture series being a general introduction to the thought of Zizek called If You Really Love Nothing. Now, I ought to say for those of you joining for the very first time today that if you are looking for an introduction that is a summary, then this class will not be for you because I try to teach these classes in a dialectic fashion. It means that you basically have to go through the entire motion of the class. So there's no clear ending point, but we pretty much cover the entirety of the process. It sort of downloads into your brain as you're partaking in these classes. Um, I should also say this is not an introduction to Zizek. This is an introduction in Zizek. We're thinking within Zizek's thought. Okay, hello. <laughs> Here comes the birthday girl herself. Oh. <laughs> That's right. Um, I'm glad this wasn't actually your birthday. We got to have a, a live <laughs> yes. stream free birthday, which is pretty good. I passed on well wishes from several people to you, so yes. you know they were received. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> that's right. Okay, I'm actually going to take off my coat for a moment because it's I'm like it's, too warm. It's warm, um, but it's going to get colder. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. So I was just introducing this class. Oh, excellent. And saying that for those of you joining for the very first time today, mm -hmm. uh, we teach this in a dialectic fashion. So that means that. Uh, we're not talking about Zizek. We're sort of trying to swim within the murky waters of Zizek's <laughs> thought. So the goal is that we will give you everything you need to know in order to read and understand Zizek. But we are not summarizing Zizek. In, yes. In fact, we've probably done most of these lectures without mentioning Zizek. Is, by it, name the, is that it the often. opposite of summarizing? I mean, if summarizing is like distilling and like condensing, well, we're trying to sort of inhabit yeah, I mean, if you take the Latin mm -hmm. root for summary being summa, which mm -hmm. is the totality, right? Mm -hmm. We're not, we're giving a totality that is not a reduction, <laughs> effort, right? Yeah. So we're giving a real summary. <laughs> I should also mention, if you're joining for the first time, that Jenlene is here uh, participating in these lectures as in, I suppose, uh, performing interlocution, which <laughs> means also interrupting, uh, <laughs> listening, asking me questions when I'm going off into areas that make slurping no sense. Slurping coffee. Exactly. Slurping coffee, essentially <laughs> uh, bringing me company. Um, I started these lectures by myself, but it's become a habit that we do them together <laughs> as it were. So it is still a lecture, hence why I am speaking for an hour <laughs> and Jenlene is not. Um, and, and I hope that's okay for you. It's certainly Yeah, because I speak in the second hour, which... That's we right. don't film. That's true. We don't, we don't film. <laughs> okay, so I think we should dive right in. Yes. Uh, you don't have to have any previous knowledge of last week's lecture, mm -hmm. but if I were to give you a little bit of a previously on, <laughs> it would be that we talked about Heidegger. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the role that Heidegger plays within Zizek's mm -hmm. theoretical framework. And this is going to be the Lacan edition. And we're so we're basically picking up with Heidegger, mm -hmm. and we're slowly moving towards Lacan, but in a very typical fashion, we're not really going to talk very much about <laughs> Lacan until the very end, <laughs> where it should click in your mind why Lacan is the, the necessary next step mm -hmm. here. And the other theme that we're going to continue is the theme of time, the theme of temporality. Um, we're also continuing every theme that we've introduced <laughs> in the last four weeks, because like I said, mm -hmm. every lecture contains a plethora of Easter eggs and the idea is that you should be able to go back to previous lectures and see those problems in a new light. Yeah. Okay. 
I want to start with the idea of birthdays for a moment. <laughs> Happy to oblige. Because it was your birthday, so you have like a, you have experience of what it means to have a birthday. First hand memories. Yeah. Yes. And there's a conversation that you and I had, one of the very first conversations mm. when you and I were still dating. Mm-hmm. Ancient history. <laughs> and I I was struck I had a very weird question to you. It's probably not a good question to ask someone on a first date. <laughs> but I was really pondering this problem, which is if you have twins, mm-hmm. and this is not a problem to anybody except for me. <laughs> if you're gonna have twins, mm-hmm. the fact that one of the twins is born first mm-hmm. and the other one is born slightly after that one mm-hmm. struck me as being really uncanny and really mm-hmm. unpleasant because mm-hmm. at that point you've taken a perfect harmony the idea of like a double being mm-hmm. coming from i don't know how it works exactly from one egg is this true well sometimes yeah and and you've created a temporal division mm-hmm. which is birth mm-hmm. essentially and mm-hmm. this is something that really bothered me made mm-hmm. me really uncomfortable mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you you probably don't remember what well, your the answer platonic was platonic fear of a copy of a copy and there's the sense that like one has to be the original and the other has to be the duplicate and the notion of which comes first i think sort of plays into that i said well one of them has to be first ah so you do remember yeah, of course excellent yes jenlene <laughs> is jenlene is very wise in her own way and and you i remember it distinctly it really made an impression on me you said well one of them has to come first mm-hmm. And, and I f- I, that really, like, eased my mind. And- I think that only children have very different existential dread about sibling family than those with siblings. I'm an only child, and Julian has a wonderful... wonderful not twins, large, though. I'm not a twin. Large family. <laughs> At least not that I know of. Um, yeah, so the reason that I bring that up is <clears throat> there's sort of this this problem here that was making me feel uncomfortable, which is the fact that as soon as you are born, Mm -hmm. you are thrown into being and you are thrown into a form of temporality. And this is more vivid in the case of twins, Mm -hmm. because when you're a twin, um, you're a sense like you're one made out of two. Mm -hmm. And so this anxiety that I had back then, unbeknownst to me, Mm is a similar anxiety that runs through Heidegger's work Mm. and part of why Heidegger never completed his work. It's the problem of what Heidegger calls Gewaffenheit. And Gewaffenheit means to be thrown into something. So Waffen Mm -hmm. is to throw something. And Gewaffenheit is the state of being thrown. It's a very awkward word. I mean, no one would really use it in any, in any, sense mm-hmm. because you can't really be th- I mean unless you're like a dwarf who's like <laughs> thrown by someone um, but so Gewaffenheit is this problem of you're being thrown into the world mm-hmm. so you're launched into temporality right. in a sense you become subject to time mm-hmm. of course you're already subject and in the nine months in which you're in gestation in gestation think uh, yeah that would be well you, yeah. well you go from sort of timelessness into temporality that's sort of the act of birth yeah. because i mean it's a constant questioning of like how old are you and you know there's so much meaning associated with age yeah exactly you're mm-hmm. in the world right mm-hmm. you're a living being confronted mm-hmm. with what it means to be Mm-hmm. From a Freudian perspective, as soon as you're born, also mm-hmm. you experience drive, etc. Mm-hmm. So we have here the sort of the problem of temporality. Mm-hmm. And Heidegger never completed being and time. Mm-hmm. He never wrote the third part, the time and being part that would be the third and fourth. I mean, he has other projects that contain it, mm-hmm. but there's a turn in Heidegger's thought where he can't confront that that problem and it's a problem we described in the previous lecture well and it's sort of been a theme throughout all lectures this notion of needing completion by a different viewpoint yeah. the the problem of beginnings right the problem of mm-hmm. grasping a beginning mm-hmm. um but so where heidegger runs and i'm not going to make this too technical but mm-hmm. basically where heidegger s- finds a paradox the whole everything in heidegger can be described like this it's the clash I don't know if you can see my gestures here. <laughs> it's the clash between ontological insight mm-hmm. and ontic blindness. And for non-philosophy okay. students here, <laughs> ontological means being. It mm-hmm. basically means like the origin of your being. 
So ontological insight means to have a reflection on the origin of being. Mm -hmm. And ontic blindness, ontic means what's in the world, the objects in the world. And so ontic blindness, if you're looking away from what's right in front of you, mm -hmm. you can have an insight of being. But if you're looking away from being, mm -hmm. you can see the things in front of you. Right. It's, it's sort of like a peripheral vision in a sense. Yeah. Like what you can see when you're not looking directly at something. Yeah, exactly. That's something that Zizek uses quite a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Is how do you practice that peripheral vision? Mm -hmm. um, I think he uses the term like the parallax view, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Um, we talked about like the gargoyles in the crying angels in Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. It's that same. You look away and it moves. So how do you look at it? It's only moving mm -hmm. while you're looking away. <laughs> and this is the problem that Heidegger has, mm -hmm. which is how do you contemplate ontological being, mm -hmm. which means that you're blind to what's happening in the ontic world? Right. Or how do you look at the ontic world and you become in so doing blind to ontological being? Mm -hmm. And so for Heidegger, the subject is essentially stuck. The person is stuck. Mm -hmm. And this is a stuckness that Heidegger really struggles to go beyond. Mm -hmm. And that's also why Heidegger says that temporality is the old horizon of being. Mm -hmm. The name for the problem of this stuckness mm -hmm. is time. We can't stop things. Mm -hmm. We can't do both. Mm -hmm. This is also a real flaw in Heidegger in many ways is that he doesn't have the courage to go beyond this problem, yeah. or at least he doesn't mm -hmm. have the mm -hmm. framework. Mm -hmm. And one of Zizek's arguments here, I can summarize very quickly. It's allowed mm -hmm. because of course the problem with Heidegger is how can we explain Heidegger's uh, Nazi period? Mm -hmm. And usually there's two camps. Mm -hmm. There's a camp that says, Everything in Heidegger's thought leads him to being a Nazi. Mm -hmm. This is the Adorno camp. Mm -hmm. Adorno basically says Heidegger's thought, Heidegger is fascist to his very selves. Mm -hmm. Everything about Heidegger <laughs> is fascist, then of course he became a fascist. This is Adorno's response. Mm -hmm. And then there's sort of the apologetic one, which mm -hmm. says, no, it was just a little mistake. He became old, his instincts were off, et cetera. It's sort of like trying to say, well, it wasn't really, it had nothing to do with his theory. Mm -hmm. And Zizek kind of finds a middle path there because Zizek says it has everything to do with his theory, but it has everything to do with the fact that he could not actually complete his theory. Mm -hmm. That the Nazi temptation of the closed system of the event of Nazism was something that Heidegger sought as a shortcut to mm -hmm. actually finishing his project. Yeah. And so it doesn't derive from the success of his system but it derives from the failure of his system yeah the inability to reach his own conclusion necessitated him looking externally in yeah, a sense. yeah exactly he couldn't face up to that problem mm -hmm. and where zizek disagrees with heidegger mm -hmm. is for zizek fascism is always a pseudo event mm -hmm. fascism is not really the unfolding of history it's reactionary because a fascist will say we're going to change everything mm -hmm. in order to keep it the same we're going to make america great Again, we're not going to make America great. Mm -hmm. That's the fascist reactionary inversion. Right. And for Zizek, communism mm -hmm. is a genuine event mm -hmm. because it's the driving force of history's contradictions. Not going to go into the <laughs> politics here, but that's just quickly like what you have to understand. Okay. Oh, thank you for getting a uh, coffee. I really, I really <laughs> love that. That's excellent. I'm going to talk about the visit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So a brief divergence here. Thank you if you're still us um the uh swiss playwright Dürrmatt, uh who unfortunately uh would have been a hundred years i think last week but no one usually tends to live that long uh he wrote a play i think in german it's called besuch der dame or something besuch einer alten dame but it's just called the visit we take away the old lady part in english it's called the visit and the basic premise of this play is that there is a town in which a ah here comes this is the visit of the young lady yes thank you very much i'm I talking know. about uh the visit by now older lady yeah the visit yes so the basic premise of the play the visit is that there's a town mm -hmm. and a very wealthy woman returns to that town so she grew up in that town and she's coming back mm -hmm. having made millions or billions she She's like a tycoon. <laughs> and what she does is she finds 
the man who slighted her yes. when she was young, so who jilted her, or mm-hmm, I don't know, ghosted mm-hmm. her, or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and she has a very interesting idea, a proposition. She goes to the town, mm-hmm. struggling the financially, the yes. townspeople, and she says, I will give you all the money in the world to financially revive this town. You'll be a shining light in your region. Mm-hmm innovation, jobs, <laughs> I don't know, a center for a digital... A full grocery store. Yeah, yes. exactly, everything. Uh, I have one condition, <laughs> and the one condition is that you kill this man um, because he has to die. And the reaction here is really important because the townspeople come together mm-hmm. and then they say, Oh no, we could never kill this man. Who do you think we are? We a demo- we're a democracy. Mm-hmm. We have institutions. We have law and order. You and your petty money think that you could get us to kill this man. Who do you think you are? We don't need your money. Mm-hmm. And they send her packing. And the woman says, thank you. I've gotten what I need. And at that moment, when you think to yourself, wait, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> the town just told her that they're not going to kill the man. Mm-hmm. And yet, what she knows at that point is that she's already brought the context Mm -hmm. of his death into being and the act will follow retroactively in other words all of a sudden the people in the town start behaving as if they'd already received the financial stimulus yes so they start buying things on credit (laughs) they start construction projects (laughs) But they haven't killed the man because, of Mm -hmm. course, they're not going to kill the man. They're a democracy. Mm -hmm. And the man, of course, slowly realizes that this new context, the world being built around the speculation surrounding his death, will inevitably have to justify Mm -hmm. posteriori Mm -hmm. his own killing. Right. Because they're acting as though they've already committed the crime. And they sort of gaslight him in this incredible way. Because they deny that their spending is responsible. And they're saying that that's just, you know, a product of their loyalty to the town. But he understands that yeah. and it so it's too a, tempting. Yeah. So it's an ideological play, right? Mm-hmm. They're mm-hmm. justifying. But what's so key here is they're not justifying their wealth by saying we killed him, but... Mm-hmm. They haven't actually killed him. They actually haven't actually had <laughs> the guts to kill him, but they're acting as if they had killed him. And so what happens slowly is that the context becomes initial and the act follows. Cause and event become inverted. Mm-hmm. And in the very end, there is a tribunal of the townspeople in which they determine according to democracy and law and order (laughs) and every sacred institution of the town that this man must die, not for the woman and not for the money. How could you even suggest such a thing? But because he is evil to his very core. (laughs) So it's it's one of the most like harrowingly beautiful uh, examples of like that inversion of cause effect. And it's really important because it's going to be the key to how we start cracking Heidegger's dilemma. Mm. Because remember, Heidegger's dilemma is you're thrown into the world Mm -hmm. and you have to throw yourself out of it. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to contemplate being in existence. So there's Gewaffenheit, you're Mm -hmm. thrown into the world. Mm -hmm. And what you have to do is you have to do Entwurf. And Entwurf is a, is a, a pun almost mm-hmm. has two meanings because entwurf both means design, mm-hmm. like entwerfen would be to come up with a design for a chair or a mm-hmm. building, okay. but it also means to throw out. Mm-hmm. And so the subject has to throw himself out mm-hmm. of his own being or mm-hmm. of his own ontic existence mm-hmm. to contemplate mm-hmm. being. Mm-hmm. So this is the problem we're mm-hmm. facing, and and I hope we can do it in an hour. Maybe we'll go over <laughs> an hour here. So. I want to briefly about the idea of the forced choice Mm. because you know we we just had this the visit the play that i just described Mm -hmm. in a sense here we have a perfect example of the idea of the forced choice Mm -hmm. because the woman says you can choose to either kill this man and accept my, my money or you can choose to not accept my money and to keep him alive but it's a forced choice because no matter what they choose they end up killing the man even if they, it takes them a longer way to get there. Mm-hmm. And so this is actually 
almost the inverse of how Lacan frames forced choice. Mm. Because Lacan says a forced choice is like when you're mugged on the street and the robber, mm-hmm. if this word you call them robbers, <laughs> and the robber says your money or your life. Right. Do you mean false choice? False he, choice. Okay. What did I say? Forced. forced I don't know. No, no, no. He, no, you forced choice. Okay. Yeah, no, no. Okay. It's, it's not just a false choice. Okay. Because you do have a choice. Okay. But I'll, thanks for clarifying. Yeah. yeah. So when the mugger says your money or your life. Mm-hmm. Nobody we, ever says, okay, just kill me. Yeah, no one's going <laughs> to gonna say hey just kill me <laughs> and and so it's not really a choice right, right? he's basically just mm-hmm. saying give me your money right. he's threatening you with your life mm-hmm. to take your money okay and the reason that lacan uses this is he's actually playing with he's playing a game with kant mm-hmm. it's also raining quite heavily outside i don't know if anyone can hear <laughs> does this does it sound relaxing i hope it does yeah <laughs> um okay so kant has his own version of a false choice which Lacan has issues with hmm. as you, and it has to do with sex so cover your ears if this is a covering your ears moment and um the the scenario that Kant frames mm-hmm. is basically the following everyone at some point most people would like to have sexual intercourse with some person of their imagination I don't know like some idol that you've decided you'd like to sleep with and Kant says what if the fairy of wish fulfillment arrived? <laughs> I guess all fairies are fairies of wish, wish fulfillment. fulfillment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if a fairy of wish fulfillment arrived and said, you can now sleep with X, you mm. can have a romantic, mm-hmm. and it's not even like gross. Like mm-hmm. it's like you could have the night of your dream. Your fantasy could be fulfilled. Yeah, exactly. The, the night of your dreams, mm-hmm. fantasy fulfilled, mm-hmm. but big, but mm-hmm. as soon as you're done, mm-hmm. you're going to walk out the room and we're going to execute you. <laughs> That's the <laughs> hypothetical that Kant frames here. And Important philosophical problem. <laughs> right? Thanks, Kant. I know. It's like pre-internet. So Kant's conclusion here is that nobody would do this. Right. No one would actually want to fulfill uh, a bodily pleasure. Well, because then they also lose the fantasy. A fantasy only has power because it is a fantasy. True. But that's a different issue. No, it's it's actually you're leading in the right direction. Okay. Yeah. But remember, we're going to disagree with Kant, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Kant says no one's going to do this because mm-hmm. no one would ever, ever, if you make a wager, what's more important, my life or having a splendid night of romance mm-hmm. with, mm-hmm. I don't know, I don't want to say any real name. <laughs> it's going to be too revealing. Some, some woman from the 1800s that Kant was infatuated with. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Someone who had a birthday yesterday. <laughs> and uh, so we can already see echoes here of the castration complex, but anyway. Um, an echo that, pre- well, an echo is always mm-hmm. after the sound, so right. it's a pre echo. Yes. So, uh, premonition. Premonition. Mm-hmm. So basically, Kant says nobody's going to do this. No mm-hmm. one's going to have a romantic night if the cost is the end of your life mm-hmm. afterwards. Mm-hmm. And Lacan jumps in here in a very Lacanian fashion. Lacan, French psychoanalyst, mm-hmm. and says, wait a minute, <laughs> you're completely getting this wrong. Mm-hmm. First of all, who is to say that there aren't people who would do this? Mm-hmm. Because there's plenty of people who have amorous encounters knowing that it will probably cost them their life or their dignity or the lives of others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We constantly make terrible decisions about who to sleep <laughs> with and who not to sleep with. Like you've created a false choice here because you've made your money or your life. Yeah. You said sex or your life, mm-hmm. but it's what if it were you have sex with that person and then you face shame mm-hmm. or your family mm-hmm. faces mm-hmm. shame. Like you've created a false choice here. Mm-hmm in terms of your false choice, right? right? right. We're not mm-hmm. at the forced choice. Yet. You've mm-hmm. created a false, false choice, choice because you're just saying it's not your money or your life. It's a, it's sex or your life. Mm-hmm. So Lacan says many people would choose, but more radically and more Lacanian, he says the thing that Kant misses here is that if you're provided with the opportunity to choose between either having a night of sex and, f- and being executed mm-hmm. or no night of sex, and having your life Mm -hmm. is that what if the condition of having really good sex is to 
be aware that you're probably going to be killed for it. In other words, what if the arousal is not the encounter, but it's the imminent death? What if what really turns you on is the execution and not the encounter? Okay. Thanks, Th- Lacan. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the Lacanian. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and so, because what Lacan basically interjects here, mm-hmm. that you can't make a psychological, biological yeah. split mm-hmm. between on one hand my <laughs> fantasy which is i'm gonna have mm-hmm. the amorous encounter and i'm going to be killed by logical severance of life right the anticipation of the finite element of life mm-hmm. is embedded in the romantic encounter mm-hmm. in other words the desire to reproduce mm-hmm. and the fantasy can be sustained mm-hmm. by the very means of thinking this is a this is a huge mistake mm-hmm. so lacan is basically saying a lot of people who make mistakes know they're making mistakes mm-hmm. and that's part of what makes it enjoyable mm-hmm. as it were. Okay. Enough like sex talk here, <laughs> but this is sort of, this is sort of yeah. important mm-hmm. because we haven't thought this through entirely. Does this also yeah. help us go from false choice to forced choice? Okay. Because we haven't thought the forced choice mm-hmm. through fully. And the distinction isn't super important mm. between false choice okay. and forced choice here. Okay. Um, because what we haven't done is we're still at the ontic level. In other words, mm. we're still looking at choices in the world. Mm-hmm. And we've got these crazy hypotheticals between, I don't know, sleeping with someone and being killed or etc. We haven't looked at the ontological dimension, mm-hmm. which is, in a sense, every choice is a forced choice. Because every choice is already pre-chosen and what i mean by this is that in order to choose you have to choose to choose there's that do you see what i mean yeah every choice means i have chosen to make a choice Mm -hmm. and so to make a choice doesn't stand on a pure platform of pure intention Mm -hmm. there's always something before that Mm -hmm. You can't say I've stopped time and Mm -hmm. I'm weighing Mm -hmm. all my decisions and I'm going to choose. Mm -hmm. No, you've to choose is itself a choice because you could have chosen not to choose. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yes. And so the problem is that choosing creates the same problem again that that Heidegger feels the you can't opt out of it. You can't stop it for a moment. Well, and especially because choice I think can also be wrapped up in procrastination, like choice is also about trying to defer something so that a choice no longer becomes a choice. It becomes a requirement because you've decided to put it off and put yourself in a situation where it's no longer optional, but a requirement. So you mentioned procrastination. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about procrastination is that the sense of procrastination Mm -hmm. and the anxiety that you get from it Mm -hmm. is the continuation of time Mm -hmm. without the intent Mm -hmm. of using that time or filling Mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. So it's awareness of the passing of time Mm -hmm. without a deliberate action ascribed to it as it were. And, and in a sense, you're right that this is the anxiety of choice. Mm -hmm. This goes back to also the sort of radical politics of choosing not to do something, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You let it sort of continue. Um, what I, what I briefly want to link this to mm-hmm. is, again, the idea of context. Remember, we talked about the visit. Mm-hmm. The woman says, if you take my money, you will kill this man for me. Mm-hmm. But she knows that if they don't take her money, they're still going to kill the man. They're just going to have to justify it differently. Yes. And so we have here cause and effect. We have mm-hmm. context and decision. The decision in the visit, the decision to kill the man, doesn't precede the action. It follows the action. Right. The decision to kill the man is made after the fact at the very end of the play because they've acted as if he is already dead. Right. And for Lacanian terms, mm-hmm. this is true for all human action. The context creates the decision, not the decision creates the context. Well, and it's also the creation of justification. Yeah, but mm-hmm. retroactively. Right, right. And so the idea here is that every decision you make will retroactively look like a decision. Mm-hmm. Uh, this happens quite often in life. Like you do something in your life and 
and you think, in a sense, this was always logical. Like mm -hmm. everything led me up to this point. Mm -hmm. Why didn't I see it coming? <laughs> and then you realize you didn't see it coming because <clears throat> what makes it logical only emerges in hindsight. <clears throat> this is also the Hegelian idea of the owl of Minerva only takes flight at night, <clears throat> which, sorry, I'm losing my voice here. I'm sorry. Which is, <laughs> that's totally fine. Okay. Which is the idea that it's not just that we have knowledge from hindsight. <clears throat> it's not we have knowledge because we're looking back something. Mm -hmm. It's that sorry, I'm like I'm like actually losing, losing your voice. Well, it's <clears throat> the idea that meaning is created when we look back over something. Exactly. Yeah, that's perfectly put. That's really really good, right? So it's not that <clears throat> there's something behind us mm -hmm. that we can now reflect upon from our right. pedestal of time. Mm -hmm. It's that the thing only came into being. Mm -hmm precisely because we're looking at it yes it's again the dr hugh weeping angels right mm -hmm. they're moving because we're not looking at them right so the very act of moving away from it creates it mm -hmm. um okay i realize this is all complex but it is good like <laughs> it's gonna wrap up if you stick with us <laughs> to the end of this lecture hopefully it will like click in your in your brains that's that's my promise <clears throat> okay so I want to take a step back because mm -hmm. we suddenly like launched ourselves. We threw ourselves into Lacan, mm -hmm. but Lacan is a continuation of the cult of Freud. Mm -hmm. And Freud is thinking about this as well. This is another one of those things where I will always be an advocate of Freud's work mm -hmm. um, in a way that is hard to explain to people in a minute mm -hmm. because Freud has a statement that I find really important. And he says the, <clears throat> the unconscious is outside of time. Hmm. The unconscious exists outside of time. Okay. Now, this seems a little bit like woo-woo. Like, what does it mean for the unconscious to exist out of time? Does it mean the unconscious doesn't own a watch, basically? <laughs> right? But it's actually a very meticulously unpacked problem mm -hmm. that I think we can talk you through pretty easily. And I'm really apologizing about my voice. I wonder why. <clears throat> I never had really, this issue. Well, I was going to say it's dry air, but it's raining, so that's <laughs> we'll obviously see. not it. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <clears throat> I'm really I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, so, basically, Freud says the unconscious exists outside of time. Subconscious? Unconscious. Unconscious. Okay. The unconscious exists outside of time. Okay. And <clears throat> the way it starts, and everyone can understand why if we mm. build it up. Mm -hmm. You've probably heard of the term instinct mm -hmm. everyone has instincts this is like one of those things that everyone knows what an instinct is it's part of our sort of general common sense knowledge yes and we think of animals having instinct so mm -hmm. certain people make the argument about human beings have mm -hmm. an instinct as well mm -hmm. and there's a problem about instinct which is a very heideggerian problem mm. technically the idea of instinct mm -hmm is a figuration or a representation of instinct. It's like a mm. Plato problem. Because okay. think about it, if we describe what an instinct is, like how would you describe <laughs> instinct? Just It's a reaction before thought. Right, yeah, exactly, yeah. right? Something that's like encoded into you, inscribed into you. Mm -hmm. Something that is sort of part of your genetic makeup. Mm -hmm. It's like certain animals like snarl well, up together. Well, it's something that's sort of beyond your rational control in a sense, yeah. Yeah, it's like this ghost in the machine almost, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That's like giving you that incentive. Mm -hmm. But the problem here is that if, if instinct is actually something that exists outside of the logos, mm -hmm. outside of thought and speech, something that is simply already a priori embedded in us, mm -hmm. then we can't actually represent it. It, it must exist outside of representation mm -hmm. because if representation is part of being in the world, mm -hmm. then it can't be also part of that. Okay. So when we talk about instinct, we're being distinctly non-instinctual <laughs> and the very idea of instinct is a word or a concept that defies the premise of in you can't instinctually talk about <laughs> instinct. Like that possible mm -hmm. what's really important here is that freud introduces the idea of drive but drive and instinct are not the same mm -hmm. and they're often wrongly associated with each other 
they are almost the exact opposite of each other. Is drive aligned with will? These yeah. are like, no, no, I'm, sorry. I'm really glad, like, it's sorry. so hard because, like, that's such that's a, a different gr- hour. No, yeah. it's such a great question, and that would be, like, a whole hour itself. Um, but let me see if I can, mm-hmm. like, this is, like, my brain's like, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Will, free will, blah, blah. Um, drive here, mm-hmm. in, in a Freudian sense. Okay is simply like the motor mm-hmm. of being the motor okay. that creates that the fire. Forward. Yeah. Okay. So for example, um, if I need to eat and I need to sleep, that is a form of drive okay. essentially. Right. Those are things that I need to do to mm-hmm. nourish myself, mm-hmm. but I think I need to do them. In other words, I go into the world thinking I need to acquire food. I need to acquire a bed. I need a partner. Like there's, it's the manifestation of instinct through the agency of the person. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So is it like, so if you're seeing it as in contrast to instinct, instinct would be like, I'm hungry and drive would be, I'm going to go into the kitchen, make something for myself. I'm going to choose what I eat. Almost. Okay. Yeah. We're getting very close because there's a tension here that you sense, Mm -hmm. which is if instinct is truly, um, What's the word? Uh, what's the Christian word for something that's born without conception? Immaculate conception. Immaculate. Okay. If, if, if instinct genuinely immaculate <laughs> and it just like emerges from your DNA, mm-hmm. then drive is already the negation of instinct mm-hmm. through the figuration of it in the world. Right. In other words, the interpretation of the subject's <clears throat> drive mm-hmm creates agency and free will right but they're not the same thing because Mm -hmm. instinct breaks down into drive and drive breaks up into agency you see what i mean okay yeah so it's not even the logical progression it's not even that instinct leads to drive it's that drive negates Mm -hmm. instinct in a very productive fashion I'm not going to say a chiasmic fashion, but okay. <laughs> well, but that's only like a node of the chiasm right, right, here, right? right. Mm-hmm. So, but so again, we have this like problem of like, which comes first, mm-hmm. essentially, right? Before and, and back. Right. Because in a sense, drive becomes the name for the impossibility of pure instinct. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's the negation of instinct mm-hmm. that propels a positivity. Mm-hmm. Now, this problem, right, of what comes first is the problem that runs throughout Freud's entire work. Uh, And you can take the two most famous concepts here, Mm -hmm. and you can immediately see how that works. Mm -hmm. The Oedipal complex, the Oedipus complex. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, we're not going to do a whole hour on each of these because, like, there's (laughs) lots of problems with the Oedipus (laughs) complex that Freud was aware of, like... (laughs) The idea of does it apply equally to men and women? Mm-hmm. Is it inverted for man and woman, etc.? Mm-hmm. But the Oedipus complex for Freud is embedded. Basically, this is something you have already. Mm-hmm. It's an a priori. It's part. Well, it's of- inescapable, and that was sort of the attractiveness I think about using Greek drama as sort of a way to read it is because it's all about the unavoidability of yeah. certain destinies. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right, right, right? It's part of your, for Freud, this is something that's already inside your, Mm -hmm. I don't know, we want to call it like neurological framework. Mm -hmm. And uh, the basically the Oedipal complex is that you desire the mother Mm -hmm. and you see the father as a rival Mm -hmm. and vice versa for Freud. If you're a, uh, if you're a woman, you desire the father and you start competing with the mother, Mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, And this is also how for Freud, the mother is starts out as an object for the child the object being breast Mm -hmm. from which is derived milk Mm -hmm. and then becomes a person which becomes first the object of desire my mother is linked to the (laughs) breast Mm -hmm. and then my mother is the person who will deny me the breast etc Mm -hmm. but i don't want to get into the woods here because like there's a lot that freud even knew that was wrong about this theory and he spent a lot of time trying to figure Mm -hmm. so the oedipus complex is already there Mm -hmm. that's my main point right And so it's coming from within. Mm -hmm. It's an internal dynamic. And the other most famous Freudian Mm -hmm. complex, I guess you could Mm -hmm. say, is the castration complex, which is the fear of 
real and symbolic castration. Mm -hmm. It is the fear from the father. Mm -hmm. And this is external. There's nothing in the child that has embedded in him okay. the fear of castration. Hmm. The castration complex is derived from the symbolic order. Okay. And so in the moment of being, the child finds himself stuck between the oedipal complex mm. and the castration complex. Okay. But neither of them fully function on their own pure ground. Mm -hmm. So in order to experience the oedipus complex, you have to live in a world in which there is a castration complex. Oh, so it's sort of like the castration complex as a social construct in a sense. I mean, I know that's not what you mean, but that sort of activates... It's social to the extent that it is coming externally from right, right. other people, from yeah. other beings. Mm -hmm. But, of course, those other beings mm -hmm. are themselves subject to the Oedipal complex when they were children and okay. subject to the castration complex. Okay. So it's a bit like a pinball machine where it's like <laughs> constantly <laughs> bouncing back. Right. And the reason I'm introducing this here isn't to get into the woods about both of these theories, mm -hmm. but it's to say... There's sirens in the background, by the way. I don't know if you can <laughs> All the sound effects this morning. It's the uh, psychoanalysis police. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, but did you refer to the castration complex? Do you know how problematic that is? Okay. <laughs> um, it's problematic because we end up in the debate about feminine sexuality and all that. This is another class. Um, the problem here is, again, this problem of stuckness, mm. which is... I have a predetermined oedipal complex, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really exist because it only functions on the predicate that there's an external pressure of the castration complex. Well, in a sense, it has to be activated. Right. right. It's, it only exists in the mediation between the two. Right. So it only exists at the exact point that the oedipal complex is negated mm -hmm. through the castration complex. Mm -hmm. It comes into being and vice versa. Yeah. Okay. And so again, we have here this constant like unfolding mm -hmm. and already we're coming close to why Freud says that the unconscious is outside of time mm -hmm. because you can start seeing here that repression is already messing with time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's always like the breakdown of a perceived temporality. It's not just something that is and that moves forward on the mm -hmm. flow of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're lots of yeah. ideas we're keeping in, but I think we're gonna I think we're gonna be able to, to kind of land this. I, I hope. Um, I want to think about how we're gonna how we're gonna stick it all together. Okay, Heidegger has an idea that by itself seems totally nonsensical, mm -hmm. and Heidegger says the future has primacy. Mm -hmm. The future has primacy over. I guess the past. He doesn't specify. He just says the future has primacy. Hmm. In other words, it starts with the future. This doesn't mean that Heidegger is saying that we should never look to the past and that we should only move towards the future. Of course, there's a temptation here in Nazism as well. Mm -hmm. But the future has primacy essentially means that the effect precedes the cause. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so we're back at the logic of the forced choice because if you're made to choose and every choice is already the decision to make a choice, mm -hmm. we are already in this universe in which everything that is now is already predicated on a pre now -ness. You see what I mean? Right. And so every decision is the decision to choose is the decision to choose, is the decision to choose. The ontological ground of the idea of choice mm -hmm. collapses. Okay. And here we have almost what, in a Christian sense, you could refer to as the idea of grace. Because if the ontological ground, mm -hmm. solid ground of my free agency of choice collapses into choice is now the retroactive move right. rather than the beginning point. Mm -hmm. Like in the play, The Visit, the decision to kill the man follows the entire, we are acting as if we already have killed him. Right. <laughs> if that happens, so if basically the ground collapses here, mm -hmm. we have almost like a Nietzschean amor fati mm. to be in love with your own fate, to say, 
I am in a sense not deciding, but I am the vehicle of deciding. I know this sounds really mm, yeah. obtuse. No. And the reason I said that this relates to the Christian idea of grace mm -hmm. is that grace is about saying not just, oh, things in life are outside of my control. I have to be part of the world as mm -hmm. if the world were part of me. It's not mm -hmm. just turning the other cheek. It's not all that stuff. It's specifically about understanding that your actions mm -hmm. are not necessarily linear, mm -hmm. temporal. Mm -hmm. Right. For example, and this is something that Heidegger never understood. Mm. One of the things that Heidegger like, fundamentally does not get mm -hmm. is that the individual is part of a community mm -hmm. and that the community, in a sense, is also part of the individual decision-making process. Right. And again, that works in the visit, mm -hmm. right? The mm -hmm. visit, the community is here, the ideological part. Right. And so... It's not just saying, okay, my decisions are predicated on my social circumstances, mm -hmm. but it's saying that my life is the process of letting myself be chosen. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just doing the choosing. I am being chosen. And the space that you inhabit, the space in which you retroactively infer meaning on your decisions mm -hmm. is the process of being chosen. You see what I'm here? Yeah. And this is still obtuse, but we're going to wrap it. We're going to wrap it up. <laughs> I hope this is a, kind of a tricky one. Um, remember for Heidegger, temporality is the ontological horizon of being. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're stuck in a between space between present and mm -hmm. past, mm -hmm. but this space is itself continuously shifting, shifting. Right. So we're never on solid ground mm -hmm. as it were. And so when it comes to making a choice, mm -hmm. if your decision is always the retroactive legitimization of the context, right. rather than the other way around, mm -hmm. I decide so that I act, it becomes, I decide to confer meaning <laughs> on what I've already what done. I've already done. Yes. At this mm -hmm. point, like you're like the Soroboros, you're mm -hmm. basically, you're consuming yourself, right. not just on the individual level, but mm -hmm. on the communal level. Right. Because everything that you do is then refracted through the community, mm -hmm. and the community refracts it to the individual. Right. And I really like. I want to make sure that we have like a really good way of like finishing this. Oh, yeah. You're gonna say. Well, it, it reminded me a little bit of when we were talking about the election. How on the eve of the election, before the votes have been counted, journalists have two articles that they've written. One is this party wins. The other is that party mm -hmm. wins. And at that moment, both of those stories are true. And both of those narratives are about how one party succeeded and the other party failed and that party succeeded and the other party failed. Those are both true. But once the election is certified, then one of them becomes publishable truth. True. Okay. Does that help? It does in a way. Yeah. Okay. Because you're, you're right to infer that there's a political revolutionary moment in that mm -hmm. uncertainty mm -hmm. because this idea of letting myself be chosen, mm. right? The idea that if I can't just choose, right. but I have to let myself be chosen mm -hmm. leads inevitably, and I think you'll see this, mm -hmm. to the Marxist conception of, real, of the class agency realizing its call within history. Right. The moment of awakening isn't mm -hmm. the moment in which you say, oh, I've been blinded. Mm -hmm. The moment of awakening is in which the agency of class struggle realizes itself. Itself, yeah. What, what that means essentially is that you are already working class for Marx. Mm -hmm. It's just that suddenly you realize you are working class. But technically, you only really become working class in the realization. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah. The self-realization of class struggle is for Marx a way of history deciding to let itself be. Yeah, let itself be seen in a sense. Yeah. Okay. But I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but this is where yeah. eventually we end up in Marxist terms, mm -hmm. right? Is mm -hmm. the the sort of idea that the recognition of yourself, mm -hmm. not just as the chooser, but as the vehicle of choice yeah. is what also the idea of universal struggle is about. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to, this is after <laughs> all the Lacan edition. So we might as well finish with Lacan. Um, Lacan tries to solve Heidegger's problem mm -hmm. 
And I think that's why it's, if you want to understand Zizek, it's really important to see the Heidegger Lacan trajectory. Mm -hmm. Because remember, we had Freud, the unconscious exists out of time. Right. We have this constant repression, isn't just repetition. Mm -hmm. Uh, trauma isn't just repetition, but it's actually the breakdown of that space of linear temporality right. uh, between oedipal complex, castration complex, between instinct and drive. Mm -hmm. And what's really important here is that, so for Heidegger, Heidegger has a concept which is being towards death, mm -hmm. and Freud has the death drive. Mm -hmm. These are not synonymous. Mm -hmm. Heidegger's being towards death is not the same thing as Freud's death drive. In fact, they function a little bit like instinct and drive mm. because being towards death is what you do in life. You're on this planet, you're in this world, you're mm -hmm. moving towards the end point of your finite existence mm -hmm. and you're mediating your finiteness mm -hmm. by means of uh, infinite acts, whether they're acts of grace or love or Mm -hmm. producing or sharing knowledge. These are infinite acts mm -hmm. that take place on the condition of your finite existence. Right. But for Freud, what be what comes before mm -hmm. that thing mm -hmm. has to be the death drive. So we have instinct mediated by drive mm -hmm. and drive mediated mm -hmm. by death drive, mm -hmm. which then leads to where Heidegger is, which is being towards death. Okay. And so if you want to do the chiasmic little game here, which is a formalistic exercise, we have the death drive, mm -hmm. which is death towards being. Right. And we have Heidegger's being towards death. Okay. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Heidegger doesn't have this awareness necessarily. Mm -hmm. So all that Heidegger yeah. sees is the ground collapsing under him mm -hmm. because he doesn't have the framework that, that I mean, he, it's not even sense. that he doesn't have it. He refuses to see it in mm -hmm. many ways. Right. And so, Lacan's innovation, because mm -hmm. we're not doing a summary of Lacan, but I want you to understand, <laughs> I want you to intuit what's important about Lacan here, is that for Lacan, the is what's called the logic of the signifier. Mm -hmm. We have here a logos mm -hmm. that is language. Because the one thing that man is thrown into, or I mm -hmm. say woman as well, right? Don't, this is my political correctness, is that I don't like it when people just say man. Um, when, and pretty soon it'll be not just man and woman, we'll have to say they, etc. So when, when everyone, everything is thrown into being, right? Mm -hmm. You're thrown into being, you're the mm -hmm. being thrown into being. Right. This happens through language. Mm -hmm. Language mm -hmm. and the symbolization of language mm -hmm. is the conferral of instinct onto meaning. Okay. As it were. Yeah. Right. So language mm -hmm. is the unsurpassable horizon of being because everything has to be thought. Mm. This is um, the, the Latin here is uh, what is it? The I need to verbum caro factum est. Mm. Verbum caro factum est. The word is made flesh. Mm. Okay. That's essentially what yeah. Lacan is doing here, mm -hmm. except he's not doing it in a Christian <laughs> sense. The word made flesh. Mm -hmm. The word made flesh is what it means to be. Mm -hmm. Logos, the thing that breathes life and meaning into man, mm -hmm. is structured like a fiction. It's structured mm -hmm. like a language, essentially. We're back here almost without realizing it to what we said last week, which is Heidegger's poetic mm -hmm. take on the fact that being is a poem mm -hmm. on which the line of man is written. Mm -hmm. Um and there's the split, you know, in Heidegger, little deviation here, Heidegger part one, Heidegger part two, we have mm -hmm. the, the young Heidegger, the Heidegger that's working towards the magnum opus of being in time, which he never completes. Mm -hmm. This is a very strict Heidegger. You know, the language here is very, very precise. Mm -hmm. It's a system that's being built. Mm -hmm. And then Heidegger following the incompletion of the system becomes the poetic Heidegger, mm. the Heidegger who's just writing constantly and trying mm -hmm. to approach everything from every angle. Mm -hmm. And, and, and they're more connected than you'd like to think, mm. because in a sense, this logic of the signifier that Lacan has language as the insurpassable horizon of being is not entirely different from Heidegger's temporality is the ultimate horizon mm. of being because speech 
uh, for Freud, language is the house we live in. <laughs> it's everything we do is within the framework of speech, right. of language, right. linguistics. Mm -hmm. The distinction is that for Lacan, this is not a nice house to live in. Hmm. This is a torture house. <laughs> we are doomed to speech. Speech is the sign of our very impossibility to grasp mm -hmm. being. Mm -hmm. And so what's really, and you know, there's even like aphasia, the mm. term aphasia on Freud, mm. uh, which Lacan takes out of the clinical practice and moves into like the philosophical practice. Aphasia becomes like the disappearance of the subject, the mm. eclipsing of the subject mm. behind being itself, mm. right? In a sense. Um, I, I, I can't go too far down the road, but look up aphasia. <laughs> this will be interesting. And so here is Lacan's innovation in one sentence. I hope one sentence. For Heidegger, mm -hmm. based on Kant, etc. This is already no longer one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good try, though. <laughs> <laughs> the subject is stuck. Mm -hmm. We can't move. We can't breathe we're stuck between ontological insight between seeing being between thinking mm -hmm. about being and ontic reality the things in the world we're stuck it's terrible heidegger never go, figures mm -hmm. out how to go beyond this lacan says it's not so much that the subject is stuck but the subject him or herself mm -hmm. is the thing of stuckness I need to say mm -hmm. this better. So instead of being stuck, mm -hmm. you are stuck. Sticking. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. English is like terrible here. <laughs> okay, so let me let me say this one more time. I, it's like I would like I want to land this part. If you think of something being stuck, mm -hmm. you think of two things, yeah. and you're in the middle. Yeah. And what Lacan says is that the nature of being stuck has a name, mm -hmm. and that name is the individual. Mm. So you're not okay. stuck between two things. It's that when two things are there, mm -hmm. being emerges. So okay. subjectivity is itself essentially a giant placard mm -hmm. of stuckness. <laughs> you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So stuck, being stuck doesn't happen to us. Mm. We happen to stuckness. Mm -hmm. And being emerges from this condition of being stuck okay does that make a little bit of sense yeah yeah because this is i know this doesn't this seems sort of trivial but like it's actually it's actually really important here because mm -hmm. it's a very it's a very very different way of approaching the idea of logos and the right. idea of speech and being mm -hmm. in the world and mm -hmm. thought mm -hmm. and so for lacan and we can go back here to the fourth space again right the problem for Lacan is he's not just messing with Kant. Mm -hmm. He's not just saying, well, some people like to have sex because they're going to die afterwards. It's not just playing games. Mm -hmm. It's about saying that the thing that you think follows after mm -hmm. isn't just after. Mm -hmm. It's also already before. Right. Because and it's saying is the person who chooses death, is that choice already somehow embedded in that individual before they're even confronted with the choice? Yeah. Yeah. And they're just retroactively justifying it right. in the same way that in the visit, I know I keep repeating this and the visit, it's not that they choose to kill the man and then they accept the money. It's that they accept the money while also saying, we're not going to kill him right. retroactively. They have to justify the killing, not as a killing, but as a necessity. Mm hmm you see what I mean? Yeah. And so if life is the unfolding of that retroactive justification of the decision making itself present through me, right. then for Lacan, that throughness mm -hmm. is not Christian grace, but it's simply a void. Mm -hmm. And that void is me. Right. I am the thing mm -hmm. that is impossible. The thing that is only ever retroactively coming into being, mm -hmm. which is at the same time the ontological ground for all being. Right. And so if you follow these lectures, and I know we're this is just tricky, you'll realize that like we've made a radical turnaround here mm -hmm. between K 
can we just be in the world and study existence through objects that materialize in our, their mm -hmm, essences mm -hmm. appear in our head mm -hmm. to this idea that it's not just that we can't, and it's not just that we're stuck, but it's that in a sense, we are the agent of stuckness and that through stuckness, mm -hmm. through that gap, everything else comes into being as or. So we have a very different idea of subjectivity here. Mm -hmm. yes. we have a really uh a kind of a messed up idea of subjectivity <laughs> here which of course appeals to Zizek <laughs> and what we're gonna do next week is we're going to see why Zizek needs this kind of Lacan mm -hmm. this idea to crack open the Hegelian absolute system mm -hmm. because the goal of this class isn't to tell you that Lacan figured everything out mm -hmm. it's simply to relate to you how Lacan is trying to solve the problem of temporality and the problem of stuckness in time that Heidegger has mm -hmm. Heidegger the ultimate horizon of being is the temporal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lacan the ultimate horizon of being is uh, the logic of the signifier of mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. and in a sense, we've made the problem into its own solution. Mm -hmm. We said the stuckness is not the end point. The stuckness is the beginning point. Mm -hmm. We said there is no end and no beginning point, mm -hmm. which we already did in the first three lectures. Mm -hmm. And using all of this, next week, we're going to do our Hegel class. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of fun to do Lacan and then Hegel instead of Hegel and then <laughs> Heidegger and then Lacan. To so see, retroactive. <laughs> to see the fairly formalist exercise, mm -hmm. if, if that's my take at least, mm -hmm. in which Zizek uses Lacan and Lacan's concepts to crack open Hegel's thought. Thank you, everybody. <sighs> This is a difficult <laughs> one, I know. It's a hard one, but like it's a really key one because remember, lecture seven is going to be the X point in our chiasmic uh, mm -hmm. lecture structure. Mm -hmm. So we're actually one lecture removed from the middle point of this lecture series. Mm -hmm. We've done one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. Next week, we've got six, which is going to be Hegel. Yes. And seven <laughs> is the moment of truth. <laughs> It's the X point in the movement, right? We're doing, yes. if you're drawing for the first time, this makes no sense to you, I'm sorry, but we've done one, two, three, and now we're doing four, five, mm -hmm. next week, six, mm -hmm. and then lecture seven is going to be the moment of truth in which we invert everything. And I want to give you one last little Easter egg here. Mm -hmm. Remember, the previous lecture was about the idea of of the Holzweg mm -hmm. yeah. to be on the wood path, yes. which is both for Heidegger a way of walking into a dead end, mm -hmm. uh, but in German also means to be totally lost. Mm -hmm. And now we've reverted this movement. We are no longer going on the Holzweg, mm -hmm. but we have what Gunngras, German writer Gunther Grass, mm -hmm. called Im Krebsgang sein. Mm -hmm. Im Krebsgang means to walk like a crab. <laughs> You're moving forward by means of war, war uh, moving sideways yes. because crabs progress through sideways movement. So we've mm -hmm. gone from the Holzweg <laughs> to the Krebsgang. <laughs> we're trying different approaches mm -hmm. and we're making ourselves mm -hmm. away mm -hmm. towards lecture seven mm -hmm. in which we have a very mm -hmm. Heideggerian Umkehre, <laughs> which is a revolution. Mm -hmm perspectival shift mm -hmm. and we will work our way back through the final six classes and then we'll have to find an animal that walks backwards yeah then we'll have to get really <laughs> really expensive therapy to explain why we're doing this <laughs> car in front of two screens so thank you thank you for joining us for joining us and we shall see you all next week yes bye-bye and hey okay, hello instagram